great feeling to come home, and uh, it was just uh, sailing underneath the, camp, the the San Francisco Bay Bridge uh, brought the just thunderous cheer from everybody everybody on board, um, and to come home was uh, and enjoy that thirty day leave uh, was uh, something that uh, one finds hard to describe. But when we were posted to Camp Lejeune to train the replacement battalion, we felt that we had uh, really, uh, uh, we must be the world's worst Marines because we knew that you're, uh, we were being posted to a place where we'd be right back in the bush again with all the chiggers and, and uh, uh, all the mites and uh, all the fevers and uh, and just more of the same, and we wondered what we had done to draw that kind of duty. And uh, for you know, we wanted a a post at a navy yard, at an ammunition dump, someplace near uh, the best of liberty. So that was a disappointment again. A great disappointment. And we thought we were, that we were the, uh, uh, the rear ends of creation in the eyes of the Marine Corps. But as it turned out, that was not so. And I don't believe that it was made up in our minds as a compensation to our feelings as a uh, offset because um, the, the men we were training, anywhere from age 17 to 30, um, after uh, a bit with us, a week or two, they began to listen. And we found that they were giving us, most of them, a great deal of respect because of where we had been. And uh, those that didn't, we took a delight in coming down as hard as possible on them to make, it re make them realize that what we were trying to instill in them is not something that you get from a book or basic training, but something that might save their butts in more difficult times. So your only responsibility was to train these new young recruits. And they were going to such places as uh, Okinawa, maybe Iwo, the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> and the occupation of uh, Japan, China. Uh, there was one thing I recollect that I may have mentioned earlier. Th there was that incident with me that uh, was half laugh, half a laugh, and and actually quite serious that happened at the uh, landing at Cape Gloucester when we had uh, taken the cow pasture that was supposedly a airstrip and uh, that had happened a couple days after Christmas in 1943 and we were on the edge of this airfield the strip that we had run over in a line of skirmishers and the jungle was on one side and the strip that was littered with uh, uh, disabled and, and uh, destroyed Japanese planes. Uh, it didn't look like that strip had been really used for a long time. And then all of a sudden the mortars started coming in. And it was plain that the mortars that were first landing to our left were being walked up along the strip in a methodical way. 
So we knew we had to get the hell out of there. But at that time, I'd taken apart uh, the guts of my rifle because it was full of dirt and mud and <clears throat> because that was a wet, dirty place and uh, hot. And all this happened very quickly. So we ran to get to the jungle, to get off the edge of the strip, get in, looking for cover. And this, all of the moving parts of the rifle were in my hand. And because uh, no one was expecting the incoming shower of, of uh, small mortar fire. Uh, and when we found cover in a ditch at the edge of the jungle away from the strip, had to put that piece together quick and uh, not drop any springs or other parts. Well, fast forward to uh, the replacement training. One of the things that I... I um, found satisfying was we'd blindfold uh, these guys and make them s strip their piece. This is an old thing. This is something that that they'd get in boot camp. But we did it in 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 a different way. We put them in ditches and in thickets and all this stuff with with uh, their pieces in their hand and that with the pieces of the rifle, the moving parts in their hand. And that came from that experience. Uh, and at first, they just, they really didn't like it. They thought this was foolish. But then when the story was told to them, it began to sink in that this might be a good thing to do. And they listened up, and they did it well. It took a few times. The story had to be told a few times with some emphasis. But... <laughs> What other lessons had you learned in the field that you could instill in these new young recruits that were going to go over into combat, besides to assemble their rifle? Mm -hmm. That uh, you had to do what you were told to do, and. Uh, <clears throat> The same way with the man on the right and on the left, that although um, crawling with your body just as in practically in the ground through the mud and the crap. off Onslow Beach at, at, at Camp Lejeune was, uh, they just w wondered why. Um, they better get used to it because that's the way it was, that's a very strong possibility of where they were going and uh, the conditions where they were going. and. Uh, uh, you might as well get a taste of it in as real time, making it as real as possible, because uh, just maybe you'd learn to stay down. And uh, because I remember a time on a beach next to the Matanacal River on Guadalcanal where we were pinned to the beach trying to get across the river and every time a man uh, raised up a foot, he went down because the Japanese on the other side of the river uh, with their nambus and maybe one heavy machine gun were grazing over that beach like a cow grazes for grass. And uh, 
so in the bush at Camp Lejeune in 1945, we tried to make them understand that, that getting down meant getting way down. What was a typical day like for you at Camp Lejeune? Well, up at uh, uh, I don't know five thirty, I guess six. Breakfast. Um, then off five mile, ten mile, twenty mile hikes. Days in the bush. Landings on on on. Uh, Onslow Beach, everything that uh, replicated war and uh, uh, being strong, strong of body, and hoped also that we could uh, make them understand that they really were dependent upon one another. How long were you at Camp Lejeune training recruits? I think about uh, I think I was there almost a year because I was there when uh, at VJ Day and mustered out a short time after that, as the back of that photo I gave you showed. Do you recall VJ Day? No, I really don't. I just know. I just recall. Believe me, what a what a what a happy time it was, and that uh, I think all 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 duties were called off that day. But I'm not sure. I don't recall. What was your impression of the recruits now that you had gone back? You weren't a young recruit yourself. You were a hardened combat veteran. Um, it must have felt a lot different than when you were training. It did feel different. You had, you had a feeling that besides wanting to, to uh, try to make them do whatever exercises we were going through better, uh, you couldn't help but have a feeling that they were going to go to some bad places. Yeah, and you hated to think of them being killed or wounded badly. That uh, because you got attached to some of them because of the feeling of respect that they gave you. That was one of the very unusual things that occurred uh, in that um, infantry training regiments uh, duty. That. Uh, that they um, showed a, a respect for people who had been there. I was married at the time, too. Got married in April of 45. After you came back? Mm -hmm. Did your wife live with you on base? We found a place to live, a lot of us did, a little town called, um, right across the street from a huge army anti-aircraft base called Camp Davis. Holly Ridge was the name of that town. We visited, stopped there one time when we drove to Florida, way back in the 50s or 60s just to see how... Did you ever see the film, The Last Picture Show? No. 
well and anyway holly ridge seemed to come right out of that movie the last picture show which was a very sensitive film and maybe it was 20 miles from Camp Lejeune and then provide transportation back and forth, you know, in, 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 uh, in trucks at, at uh, all different hours. So we lived in an apartment uh, at Holly Ridge. We were married in April of 45 and uh, I got out in September of uh, 45. So once you got back to Camp Lejeune, your living conditions were much more normalized. We were, Camp Lejeune was still called, uh, the part of it that we lived in was still called Tenth City. The uh, infantry training um, the troops lived in, in tents, the replacements lived in tents as I remember. And the instructors, that is before I was married, we lived in, in, in uh, uh, huts that were made of composition board. Remember the word Celotex? It, it was uh, uh, a board made of uh, sawdust and dust. So apartment living must have seemed nice. Yes, to you. it was. When you were done for your day, was what was your training schedule? You you trained all day, and then you were free to go home at night. Yeah. And on weekends, so you could basically live a normal life. Mm -hmm. Do you recall your last days in service? No, I don't. You know, the truth is, this. I mean, there's. The whole time is like uh, there are there there are a few pages that I remember well, like reading a book. A few pages you remember well. Then there are great, great blanks, huge. I can't. I there's, there's nothing there. I don't know. So it took me. It took me fifth. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you of an experience we had on Guadalcanal, and it took me, let's see, sixty years, until I read a book as to what we had done this day. We went on a patrol one day. We were in Division Reserve, and were bivouacked in the coconut grove, just to the north of Henderson Field. They rousted us up very early, just uh, even, even before dawn. And uh, <clears throat> I was a BAR man then. Um, <clears throat> we uh, wrapped um, the day's rations that were canned rations, we are told to wrap them in socks <clears throat> or whatever rags we had so that they'd make no noise in the pack. And uh, uh, stripped out, left the ponchos behind, traveled as light as possible, and we went out through the lines um, into the Cooney grass fields beyond um, the northern perimeter and started north. No, started, I'm sorry, south. And we moved very fast, and there were only about a dozen of us that I remember. And if you were moving south, you were going toward the ridges. And as the ridges moved further south, they grew higher. The ridges and then the valleys between them, the bridges are very steep. We move very fast, and uh, there was no smoking. 
as we climbed higher, remember, we were then in anybody's territory. We were out beyond our line. And we didn't know wh where the hell we were going. We just figured we were looking for Japanese. Because nobody, contrary to what you might get from Hollywood film or some other in, um, places of information, seldom were you told what you were doing this for. You just did it. And pretty soon it didn't make any difference because you knew what was going to come. If you were lucky, nothing was going to come. If there was, there was going to be a, a fight and uh, you wanted to do what you were supposed to do and hope that the people on your left and right would do the same thing. And uh, anyway, we kept climbing higher and higher and higher. And you look back high enough so that the uh, planes on the field were like little um, uh, tiny toys. And we came upon occasional fires, scraps of rice on the ground so that the enemy had been there too. And finally we got up so high and we were running parallel to a river and we were forced into the river and nobody wanted to get in the river because if you were caught in the water for a, for a very brief time, you were um, a, a slower moving target. And I remember being squatting in the river and a couple of officers on the bank looking at maps and then we were, and we were, it was tough going. We turned and went back. Sixty years later, I found that General Vandegrift, in, in, in a book I read by uh, uh, General Twinning, who was Vandegrift's operations officer, I think. I'm not sure of the titles. And Vandegrift had had ordered, this is how how flimsy it was there. Remember this was, this happened I think in October of 42. He had ordered these patrols to follow the rivers to the south, for he was thinking of of uh, if, 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 if things got much worse, that he would have to withdraw, burn and blow, and go into the, into the hills to fight like the guerrillas had in the Philippines. That's what that patrol was all about. And the patrols found that uh, uh, the, 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 the rivers wouldn't take the Amtraks to carry supplies, munitions, uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, south into the mountains. So another plan was devised to move east. Um, uh, units skipping one over the other in a defense line. Anyway, it was all mapped out. It was all described by twinning in this book called No Bended Knee. And it 60 odd years to find out what the hell we were really doing. I, I, I mean... When you were discharged in September of 1945, what did you do in the days and the weeks immediately following your discharge? I came home and I drank too much and... Uh, uh, tried to figure out what the devil I really was going to do, because I had no trade, no education. But I was lucky. We were all lucky. We had the GI Bill, which was the greatest thing that this country ever did. That and three and four percent mortgages. The greatest thing that this country, what a, what a country. Did you go back to school on the GI Bill? Mm -hmm. 
finally did, after I had worked for, uh, let's see, worked for a little better than a year as a laborer on many different kinds of, of, uh, of jobs, always, always uh, as, a, uh, as a construction laborer. And uh, we had uh, one, one child in um, uh, the spring of uh, 46, our daughter, and uh, yes, I did go back to school. But in order to show Uncle Sam that we were worthy, a group of almost misfits had to go back to high school, had to go back to a um, an accelerated course or courses that were held in the local high school for two months to see if we had the right stuff to go to school. There were about 25 or 30, ranged in, in age from anywhere from 20 to 30. And uh, that was some, you talk about a motley crew, but there was a teacher. Her name was Helen Estes. Eileen, she sensed that those near misfits were, were most of them were there to, because they meant it, because they wanted to, they wanted to, to, to be able to, to pass that uh, test, that training, in order to be approved to go to school. She was the most absolutely inspirational person. Where did you go to college, Ted? UConn. Went uh, uh, two years to uh, the then um, extension that was in the Barnard School in Hartford. Used to go nights and work days. And uh, And then uh, had a Model A Ford, which I bought for 25 bucks, and uh, with a pair of pliers and some wire and some tape and some screwdrivers and uh, 25 cents and 50 cents of gas here and there. Drove it two years commuting to stores. And was able, there was a lot of work then, you know, worked construction as carpenter helper most of the time, uh, worked in uh, grocery stores at night, uh, all kinds of, you could get all kinds of hours. People would let you work two hours here, an hour. You had to work, but you wanted to, absolutely wanted to. What did you get your degree in? Um, economics. No, I can hardly count. <laughs> After you graduated from college, what did you do? Well, I got several jobs from which I was fired from three, and finally uh, uh, I went to work for a new construction firm for a guy who took a chance on me, and uh, he was a home builder. And they built thousands of homes all over Connecticut, here in Manchester, East Hartford, Windsor, Wallingford, and uh, also built uh, 
um, multifamily apartments for the military, uh, sub base New London, uh, Hanscom Air Force Base, Lexington, Griffiths Air Force Base, uh, Rome, New York, uh, some uh, redevelopment in Syracuse, New York. Uh, what and did then, you do for that company? Well, first I was uh, uh, a salesman in a, their new lumber yard, and uh, then I became uh, the gopher and assistant to the uh, construction superintendent, and did that for a long time. That involved inspecting houses and and uh, uh, lining up work, and then uh, I began to uh, uh, run small jobs, um, small apartment, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, some other places, uh, West Overfield in Massachusetts, by myself until uh, I realized that the firm was getting much bigger and much more technical, and I had no uh, engineering, civil or otherwise, and I was involved in uh, uh, community politics. I'd run for the town and been uh, served a, the town board of directors for a couple of terms, one term on the board of education, and uh, I thought that uh, I'd made enough contacts with people that I might be able to make a go of it as an insurance agent. So I studied uh, enough to uh, pass the exam and went into business, uh, borrowed money. From the very people I worked for, people treated me like, I'm a lucky guy. I'm a lucky man. I have not contributed to the extent that many have, but we tried. And I was fortunate in uh, being able to make a go of the insurance agencies, That's, which uh, opened in 65 and is still active on Main Street, Manchester, USA. Ted, while you were in the service, did you form any close relationships? Any what? Close relationships. Yes, and I'm very sorry that I didn't um, keep them to any degree after the war. That was my next question. Are you in touch with any of your fellow Marines at this point? No, only in this way, which shows... I hope it shows that I regret not keeping in touch. There was a guy killed on the Watanakau River. It was partially my fault. And uh, in the day when we were pinned there trying to cross, he had told me, don't worry, I'll get you across, kid. He was 23. I was 18. <clears throat> But he sat up from behind the huge log he was lying behind, and uh, he was hit right in the middle of the forehead. Death was instantaneous. Uh, I always wanted, he was from Brooklyn, I always wanted to go to Brooklyn to see his, his family. But I never did. A couple of years ago, my sis, my daughter, and her husband 
I found out where he was buried. He was buried in the cemetery of Guadalcanal, and then he was brought back home by his family and interred in the huge military cemetery in Farmingdale, Long Island. I found out where he was, and we went there. <clears throat> and uh, I told them the story while we were there at his spot. And I was, I was glad for to to for that experience, for uh, telling them the story, was a admittedly a uh, poor second to going to see his family because it took a long, long time for real for me to realize what his death brought to me, and uh, it gave me strength to do what the hell I was supposed to do, to take men up the hill when nobody would go. He did that. Ted, what was his name? His name was Joseph Faria, F-A-R-I-A, -I, I believe. He was born in Puerto Rico. He lived in Brooklyn. And he was from the old breed. You're the first person I've ever talked with about military, the war that uh, characterized the first division as the old breed. <laughs> You're pretty salty, you know that, you know. Ted, have you attended any reunions? No, I have not. Only lately, a real, a real American hero named Bruce Watkins in this town, 1st Marine Division, Cape Gloucester, Paleyloo, a place nobody heard of when it was happening, one of the most hellish places, islands in the Pacific. For casualties and the length of time that they were there, and for living conditions to go with it the month they were there. The place where Chesty Puller, the legendary Marine commander tried to do too much. His name is Bruce Watkins. He's a very old man now and ailing. He began oh, several years ago to get uh, people from the division together. And it began with half a dozen for lunch, and it grew to 30, 40 and uh, brought in speakers from guys that had been to Iraq and other places. Uh, so we formed a bond, because he, he included me in. I was fortunate. And there were two or three other locals that uh, uh, I now stay in touch with. But no, I did not. I never attended any. I'm just not a, a joiner to that extent and never really participated in VFW things either. I'm a, you know, a card carrier, but not, not a joiner. Ted, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes, it did. I think we ought to have um, universal military training in this country, like the Swiss, like the Israelis. 
and if you do not wish to serve in the military, then have an honest to goodness Peace Corps operating, not this pat a cake, half baked or half hearted uh, uh, U.S. Um, or service we have. It's not. It's not significant enough. Um, I I think that. Uh, uh, it's made me feel ashamed that we have wars now that 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 are being fought with 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 no sacrifice from this country. If we're going to have adventuresome wars, the whole country ought to be behind it, and they're not now. And though my experiences were limited compared to many, uh, it's not fair that made me understand about wars today, wherever they are. It's not fair to send the people, even though they volunteered, without the country being also involved giving something of itself giving something of itself it 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 is not involved it's not engaged only those who are fighting were engaged it's like 1942 just after pearl harbor for that whole year in the Pacific and two and, and also in, in, in the European theater, when the people here really did not know what was going on. Especially that was true in the Pacific because it was it was a uh, it was not the main theater. And it's not fair to to, to not have the entire country involved except for the money that is uh, being just poured down the crapper and the lives this country is too engaged in its entertainment and should be more engaged in its in its adventures without without substance that is that is that is killing and maiming so many that's what wars taught me Ted, how did your service and military experience affect your life? Well, I'm a very poor example of a good guy. <laughs> but um, in the end, when all the uh, misplaced uh, poor things that I do are over with, there is, I believe, a bit of the honoring of responsibility. Even though you may not want to do it. Eileen, I think it taught a sense of Honor, honor, you can make lots of mistakes every day, but when the crap hits the fan, in that last instance, the guy once told me, don't lose your self-respect, no matter what you do, don't lose your self-respect, he was so right, and say at that last minute, 
be able to find that stuff to honor your obligations. Ted, is there anything else that we haven't covered in this interview that you'd like to add? Um, it may seem um, unusual. It seems sometimes I'm, 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 I'm not sure myself. Even in war, there is a humanness. And it gives one hope. Yeah, oh, I have difficulty making myself clear. That humanness that is shown, and I'll give you an example gives one hope that somehow, someday, the humanness shown can um, can can find its way into the human spirit to 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 make war in unnecessary. And I'll give you an example. And this was an example, maybe I said this to you before, but if so, just bear with me. This came from the, okay, this recollection. We'd spent the night at a place on the ridge. There were dead Japanese all around. It was the night with the dead. The next morning, we went down into the valley, crossed the river, went back up on a ridge, and the fight was going on off to our right. I'm sure I told you this. Anyway, this was a bit of humanness. We formed up as skirmishers on the ridge to go down and close the door behind the Japanese. When all of and we're up on this ridge, and the and the the the, the sea was off to our right, that was the north. The trail ran along uh, next to the water. The fight was going on to our right, down beyond the scrub. Suddenly this Japanese soldier began to run. We saw him, he was running along the trail. And he was close enough so that we could see that he had on a Japanese raincoat, a slicker, you could even see that his leggings were, he, everything was new about this guy. That, and I raised the BAR. And I figured if I could lead him just enough, I could take him. I, I just did it automatically. And all of a sudden, the officer, sitting on an ammunition box, off to the left about 20, 30 paces, said, put it down, son. There will be time for that. That guy was the last man out. We killed every one of them in that, about 300. He was the last man out. And that commanding officer knew that. We didn't know that. I did, we didn't know what was, was going on. There had been a horrible fight there. So he let him live. He let that guy live. His name was Colonel Lewis Walt. He had served under Lieutenant Colonel Walt, or Major at that time, Walt, I believe. In Vietnam, and maybe you can find out something for me about him, in Vietnam, he was, uh, for a while, commanding officer of all Marines there. It is my belief, and he did not, and, and, and I don't, and, and he was at odds with the, with the Washington leadership, the Commandant. I, and I got to find out, because it's my my guess that he 
was probably too careful with his men. He let that man live. Last man running. He was human. Well, Ted, I'd like to thank you for all the time you spent on this interview, and I'd like to thank you for your service.